You'd think it'd be a vacation flying between the islands of Hawaii. Golden sand, blue ocean, palm trees and Mai Tais, tropical green pockmarked with pastel. They wouldn't have any snakes if it weren't for the tourists. Civilians drop 10 grand for a week here. I don't care who you are, flying cargo on a twin turboprop is work. It's worse if you're doing it single pilot. It can be downright dangerous after dark. But if you wanted to make a living in an airplane in 2008, you didn't have many options. Historically, you could just about guarantee a couple of bankruptcies in the airlines in a normal recession. 2008 wasn't a normal recession. Wall Street was in disarray. Brokers were slitting their wrists and lease Bentleys outside of brownstones. Millions were upside down on their mortgages. The airlines hired 30 people in 2008. They furloughed a hell of a lot more than that. If you were lucky, you wound up hauling cargo in a turbine over paradise. When you die, none of that really matters. Crashing into a septic tank is about the same as crashing into a tropical sea. It was a mail run from Honolulu to Lahui, 107 miles. On the mainland, they do it by truck. Out here, it's by plane. It's one of the reasons that milk pushes 10 bucks a gallon on Kauai. In 2008, 41 cents would get a letter or ride in a turboprop. It's not a bad deal if you think about it. At an ounce of pop, it takes a few of those letters to add up to 4,186 pounds. Add 2,300 pounds of fuel to it and you're just shy of the 16,000 pound max weight of a beach twin turboprop. The Beechcraft was trailed out of Honolulu by a 737. The turboprop gives up better than 100,000 pounds to the Boeing. It also gives up 100 knots at 12,000 feet. Even on a short hop, the 737 ate the beach up. Controllers verified that the airline crew had the smaller twin in sight, then let them loose to get past. They told the beach pilot that he would follow the 737 into Lahui. Once the airliner zipped by a few miles to his left, he informed ATC that he had them in sight. Lahui has a tower, but it's not open at night. Pilots communicate amongst themselves in a common traffic advisory frequency during off-hour operations. It's not always the safest way of doing business, but it's better than nothing. There wasn't much risk to it today. The quicker 737 was in front and the cargo driver had him in sight. Drifting along in the wake of an airliner is not fun. If you're going to use air to keep 100,000 pounds of loft, something's going to happen. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Air weighs more than you'd think. To keep 100,000 pounds up, you have to push an equal amount down. Newton isn't a bad guy, but he is unyielding. The descending air lagging behind a big jet isn't the problem. It's what happens at the wingtips. Little curly cues roll off the edges. They get worse as an aircraft slows down. Perhaps this was why the pilot turned to the west while the 737 began its approach. He wanted to give those chaotic little vortices time to dissipate. It was a sound decision. It also may have sealed his fate. After confirming that the pilot had the Boeing in sight, air traffic controllers cleared him for a visual approach to Lahui Airport. The pilot switched frequencies and announced his intention to land on runway 35. Ground personnel for the cargo operator were listening in. They reported that nothing seemed to miss. The 737 landed, taxied to the terminal, quickly offloaded one batch of passengers and loaded up another. Just another day in the life of an island hopper. As the passenger jet prepared to depart, Hawaii Center controllers inquired whether they had seen the beach craft. The cargo pilot had failed to close his flight plan. It was a loose end that needed to be tied up. The captain reported that he saw the plane on the ramp. It was never clear exactly what aircraft he was looking at. That was enough to satisfy the controller's curiosity. The NTSB would get sour over this in the coming months. The Beechcraft was operated by Alpine Air. It's a Provo, Utah-based cargo carrier who has been in business since 1975. The company maintained a small base in Honolulu, operating four Beechcraft 1900Cs and another four Beech 99s. They had 14 pilots in Honolulu managed by two assistant chief pilots. In a small operation, everyone flies. One of the assistant chief pilots was on approach into Honolulu. It was an hour after the Lahui-bound aircraft was supposed to arrive. The chief pilot was informed that the aircraft was missing. He inquired air traffic controllers about it. They informed him that the flight plan had been canceled at 0515. The chief pilot was eight minutes from landing, so he didn't press the issue. On the ground, he called Lahui to get the skinny. Ground personnel confirmed that the airplane wasn't there. It was overdue, it was missing, and no one seemed to care. The assistant chief phoned Hawaii Center to get to the bottom of it. They confessed that they had never actually spoken to the pilot. They had canceled the flight plan on the word of the airline captain. They weren't supposed to do that. In their report, the NTSB would quote the section in the manual that required direct contact with the pilot prior to canceling the flight plan. It wasn't the chief pilot's job to initiate a search for an overdue aircraft, but that's what he did. 
He suggested to controllers that they alert firefighters at Lahui Airport and the Coast Guard. It didn't take much encouragement. It was apparent now that nobody knew where the aircraft was. There's a neat little trick that a pilot can pull when they're too high or too fast during an approach. It's the same trick they use when they're too close to preceding aircraft. It's called an S-turn. It's a way to extend the amount of time it will take to travel a given distance across the ground. It buys you time. It's also a useful little gimmick to replace a circle. The radar telemetry depicted a stable descent during the turn. The NTSB stated that it was appropriate for the approach. The problem was that the descent profile was not modified when the pilot began snaking along final for runway 35. He had increased the amount of time that it would take to arrive at Lahui, but had not changed his rate of descent. This resulted in him being low on the approach path. After radar contact was discontinued with Hawaii Center, the sector controller received a minimum safe altitude alert, which lasted for 32 seconds. It indicated that the beach craft was too low over the ocean. Given this, it's a wonder that ATC didn't have concerns when the cargo pilot failed to close his flight plan. Since the pilot had switched frequencies to Lahui Common Traffic Advisory, the controller could not query him about the low altitude alert. The controller failed to either note or be concerned by the fact that the final radar return depicted the aircraft 100 feet below sea level. This was six and a half miles from the threshold of runway 35. At that distance, the aircraft should have been at 1,900 feet. It may not have been far from the island, but the water was deep. Once the sun was up, the Coast Guard spotted debris floating above 800 fathoms of water. That's nearly a mile deep. They found a couple of doors, some personal effects of the pilot, and a few other things drifting in the current. Over time, a few more pieces would wash ashore. The fuselage rested on the ocean floor, a tomb for the 38-year-old pilot. They don't dive that deep for a single pilot fatality, unless you were named after a president. There was, after all, no reason to think anything had been wrong with the airplane. No mayday call, no erratic radar track, just a normal descent that terminated six miles short of the intended runway. This is where most people wonder how someone could be so stupid to fly a perfectly flying aircraft under control into the water. The thing of it is, this represents an entire category of aviation accident. The pilot wasn't stupid. He just overlooked one element for too long. He wasn't the first one it happened to. The ground proximity warning system was developed precisely because accidents like this were repeatedly happening. For whatever reason, it wasn't installed on this particular aircraft. Remarkably, ATC got an alert that the aircraft was too low, but the pilot never did. Regulators are more concerned with aircraft carrying passengers than they are with ones carrying cargo. That plain fact was stamped all over this particular accident. If passengers had been in the back, a GPWS would have been required to be installed. Alone, in the middle of the night, with a load of mail, you're on your own.